Now, more recently, there's a gentleman, Ben Davidson, who's the founder of, I think it's called uh, uh, Solar Watch or SolarWeather.com. And, and he's done a lot of work on Micronovas. And he's uh, looked at peer-reviewed papers and says that these Micronovas have occurred regularly. And I think he's come up with a figure of every 12, 13,000 years and believes that a Micronova is, is imminent. And, and I think he thinks that something is going to happen around the, the next solar minimum, which is going to be around the 2030s so is that something you've come across in your research anything you can comment well on? we work with those involved with the mind calendar system the mathematics of which have not been understood and uh in fact we gave a lecture recently with uh, a person from chile who was uh, a recognized specialist in the mind mathematical system which is one of the most superb systems ever left to the human race by the cosmic others in my logic and that suggests that between 2026 and the early 30s, uh, 2030s, we're going to see gross uh, geophysical changes. Right. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. J.J. Hurtak and Dr. Desiree Hurtak, who are a team who do really amazing pioneering work in a number of fields. And because their experience goes back to the early 1970s and because they've done so much, I thought it'd be great to invite them to Exopolitics today to get them to introduce themselves and to understand exactly how it was that they got involved in this work. So thank you for uh, being here, doctors uh, JJ and Desiree Hurtek. Thank you very much, Michael. It's an honor for us to be on your program. As you know, Desiree and I have extensive academic backgrounds. I is with the University of Minnesota, where I had a doctorate uh, degree in uh, intellectual history, as well as oriental sciences, as well as a doctorate from the University of California in social sciences. Desiree's work, of course, was at the University of Syracuse and in New York, she was a professor. And so we bring together a wide panorama of research in many disciplines. Right, and so we're happy to be here today. And really, as you said, we go back to the 70s, to the time with uh, Andrea Puchark and Uri Geller when they were starting to be popular. Uh, and Dr. Hurtak had intertwined. He didn't work directly with SRI, which is remote viewing people, but he did work with Andrea Puhark, who was doing a lot of the remote viewing Actually as in well. parallel phase with SRI. Yeah. I did work with SRI in a later context of remote sensing and remote uh, viewing experiments. And of course, co-wrote a book with uh, Russell Targ uh, called End of Suffering, because Russell eventually found out, hey, you know, if you really can see everywhere around the world, I mean, this is a whole new reality taking place. And we often equate it also with really the way extraterrestrials and other levels of intelligence use their consciousness. And so we love the idea of remote viewing because uh, Ingo Swan showed you can remote view to Jupiter. And he did that. Before. The rings around Jupiter before the NASA got there. In fact, Ingo allowed us to use one of the pictures of his marvelous pictures of the human mind as a cosmic egg opening up to see it where, it where the power of the whirling galaxy embedded within our consciousness for one of our books that we co-wrote with Russell Targ, one of the co-founders of the whole discipline of what is called remote viewing. So we have had the opportunity to work behind the scenes uh, in, with some of our colleagues in what we would call the world of black science, that is to say, in super sensitive subjects, as well as in the practical world of those who are doing field research. And Desiree and I have had the opportunity to work in more than 30 countries and uh, really with some of the best of the scientists in, involved with future science or future studies. Science guided by consciousness is what we call future science. Yes, I saw some of the, your early uh, interviews 
And you discussed how you began doing this uh, remote viewing and I guess the SRI or Stanford Research Institute kind of like uh, inspired that. And, and you saw through remote viewing, or I think you call it remote sensing, you saw pyramids on Mars. And, and because of what you saw, you were then handed images from the Mariner 9 showing these pyramids on Mars. Uh, so can you explain what happened there? All right, let me start with uh, remote viewing being the power of the mind to see in other spaces. And I also will throw out other time realities, but remote sensing is another technology that Dr. Jack and I have worked with, especially in our archeological research. And that is where you use actually technology to uh, see what's below the ground, or in some cases, what's in, from space into the ground. Right, uh, remote sensing is with a, with technology, remote viewing is without technology. And of course, I was able to tell my NASA colleagues as a private uh, consultant that uh, there would be the finding of pyramidal formations in what is later called the Elysium Quad Triangle on the surface of Mars. And because of the accuracy of my predictions, I was able to get NASA management to give me a few pictures, which appear in my book, The Keys of Enoch. I was the first to actually published these pictures from the Mariner 9 probe in 1972. Right, so it says that we already knew or felt from information and also from Dr. Hurtak's unique direct experience he had in 1973, that there had been and probably still in some capacity is uh, intelligent life on Mars. Right, and this put me in touch with many outstanding individuals behind the scenes who were aware that uh, Human civilization uh, from the very get-go was interested in using pyramids as chronomonitors or time measuring devices in relationship to the movement of the sun, the moon, and distant or sister planets such as Mars and Venus. So we had the opportunities over some 49 years to lay out a world roadmap based upon my original research that shows indeed there are these what we call time doors or time vaults where the human race historically has been in touch with what we will call extrasolar intelligence or intelligence beyond our solar system. All right, Michael, I know this goes along with a lot of your own research that, you know, pyramids around the world, we've been to the ones in Xi'an and China, and of course the ones in Mexico and certain ones in South America and other locations, even the Gimpy Pyramid in Australia, we actually have a little YouTube on that. Uh, you know, these are not just happenstance because cultures individually all over the world decided to do something. You know, there's something about the geometry the sound frequencies that we've recorded inside these pyramids and just their alignments to the stars. And in fact, I, just to go a little bit further, there was a young kid in Canada, in French Canada, uh, named something like Godry, who did alignments between the stars and the temples of the Yucatan. And he totally aligned almost all the sacred temples. In fact, he even found one that was missing connected with Orion. So, you know, these are not just happenstance situations. There's something behind it, some intelligence behind it. I think you agree. In fact, the map he came out with matches the one that we published in 1973. Maybe you cannot see this. Yeah, yeah let me put it. Yeah. What is called the Guatemala Triangle between Chichen Itza, Kalamakuyu, which is the ancient area of Guatemala City, and Tres Zapotas. It shows an area now that National Geographic scientists and scholars have investigated, they had a massive population upwards of 12 to 15 million people, according to recent demographic studies. So right, but at the time of Christ or right before the time of Christ, before they were wiped out by climate change, actually from what most archeological people believe. So the Keys of Enoch is our real uh, roadmap and has brought us- Well, before we get into the Keys of Enoch, before we get into the Keys of Enoch, I just wanted to kind of follow up on this difference or this distinction between remote viewing and remote sensing. You say remote sensing uses technology. And I, and I know Dr. Andrea Poharic, he was actually using a Faraday cage to, to improve the performance of psychics. And, and that, that, that came to the attention of the army back in 1952. And they actually forcibly recruited him into the army uh, to do this uh, work in using technology to improve psychic abilities. So it sounds, and you were obviously working with Andre Paharic. So was that was that part of what you were doing, remote sensing? Well, actually, okay, let me go back with Andrea for a minute and 
basically he was, I think he was already, because this is the 50s, right? He was somewhat connected with the army and he was working as a medical doctor. He was a medical doctor, MD. And uh, some guys started getting like communication. It, it was like really strange. And so Andrea researched it. He was the guy to research what this was all about. And it turned out that the guy had had some sort of metal placed in his tooth by a dentist that was receiving local radio signals. And that's exactly what started Andrea in this entire thing. But ultimately in his research, he realized that other people were getting similar signals, not by the local radio. So that's where the Faraday cage got employed by Andrea because he realized if you could cut out these local radio type of signals, we're talking about 50s, 60s and 70s, then you could like really get clear on the information coming through some of the more sensitive individuals. So, and that's not quite actually remote sensing. Remote sensing is really something that NASA and other government agencies have done to deploy and look for, and some even corporations, to look for oil and gas underneath uh, the sands and even underneath certain types of water scenarios, but mostly they can penetrate down. So like, for example, in Egypt, we use remote sensing technology, ground penetrating radar, to be able to see certain types of cavities underneath the paws of the Sphinx. Now this is like, you can't really say it doesn't exist when you can hit the ground and see this like kind of cavity coming up underneath the paw. Going down four or five meters. So, you know, this is what's amazing. And dry sand is even better than wet sand. And wet, you have to use sonar and there's different things you can do it from, from satellites well, and you can do it from Some airplanes. of this is summarized in our book called Mind Dynamics in Space and Time with the uh, celebrated mathematician physicist, Elizabeth Rauscher from SRI, where we collaborated in some of the work in looking both with remote viewing, I and Elizabeth and Desiree participated in more recent studies with matching the historic record with remote sensing, with the radar and what we call GPR, ground penetrating radar profiles. And they matched, suggesting that we're in a whole new chapter of human engineering. We are at a point of time where we can save literally generations or decades of research by these very valuable tools. So to summarize, uh, Andrea came to me because he knew I had psychic and paraphysical experiences and asked me to join his work. And he was working a top end of people connected with naval intelligence, army intelligence, and the other uh, information gathering agencies. And so- Right, he was one of the key people who joined up with astronaut Edgar Mitchell and brought Uri Geller to the SRI program. But that's another story. Oh, well, we want I'm to ground this specifically in the historic millions in time that we had a joyful time with Andrea for more than 25 years, looking at areas of the world, not only where we were able to assess archaeological targets, but in some instances, as the book Mind Dynamics tells us, to actually intercept uh, certain military operations. Right, because if you can kind of sense and tune into other people's minds, which remote viewing tells us we can't, then why can't you work somewhat to at least instill or put intentions to neutralize some of the aggressive minds? And that was what we did. And we think, and not only us, but people around the world, of course, should do this. Uh, and not feel, you know, over uh, extended by the energies coming to us from all the violence on this planet. Let's put energy out into the consciousness field to neutralize some of that. And we found in the 70s, we think we helped collectively, it was a whole network of us around the globe, to neutralize any violence that was going to take place in the Middle East. This included three cabinet ministers of the late President Kennedy. Well, out of office at that time, we're interested in paraphysics, parapsychology, and the possibilities that the human mind could connect with other information sources. The one guy even actually saw in his mind how he could neutralize, because he understood some of this technologically, like some sort of missile. So he actually saw a missile being neutralized through the power of his mind. And I know Uri Geller used to sit on an airplane behind, and he's publicly made this statement, behind Russians, and he would like go erase, 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 and he like focus on the briefcase and actually erase 
data he thought, you know, he was thinking he did, uh, of the briefcase of some Russian spy. So it's kind of an interesting thing that we can do with the power of the mind. One of the things that uh, I found uh, very fascinating in uh, your association with uh, Dr. Poharich was his work in trying to bring out the information from this group calling itself the Nine, or the, some call it the Council of Nine, and, and you were involved. I mean, you've actually been described as the right-hand man, uh, JJ, of uh, Dr. Puharich. So how did you get to be so important in terms of his work uh, doing this uh, pioneering research and getting information out about these advanced extraterrestrials, the Nine, who are kind of like uh, overseeing this cosmic experiment on Earth? Well, Andrea was able to filter information very carefully from those who he was associated with. Again, a lot of this was sub rosa or private uh, research that he was doing. And he felt I had a great degree of accuracy in some of my predictions, both in areas of social science, archaeology, as well as future science targets uh, on our sister planet Mars and beyond. Uh, needless to say, he was at that time in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, interested in bringing together what we will call the gifted children or young people between the ages, I would say, of 18 to 28. Or even lower, <laughs> actually went down to later, 12. Later dropping down to mm -hmm. even much uh, earlier age that would be able to be sensitive to issues around the corner. It's suggesting that there was a whole new generation of young adults, particularly American uh, young people who were interested in pushing the envelope of science, or we would call it the scientific paradigm, more into the area of consciousness. Right, we call them the star sea kids today, but this is going back to the 70s when he realized that a lot of these kids were being taken to other planetary systems and taught information. And so, you know, he had his own contact, but he also, we'll say, positively uh, tapped into the thoughts and consciousness of some of these younger kids to pick up what they were getting about the planet. And it wasn't always positive. It was a little bit dire in terms of what they saw the planet in the future to be like. So to answer your question directly, I had so several paraphysical contact experiences before I met him, Andrea, in 72. Uh, what happened is we sat down at the table together and he wanted to know who I was in contact with. And so I wrote uh, a code system of letters in ancient Hebrew. And he wrote letters from his side of the table and we put the two scripts together and they matched. So he, he knew and I knew we were working with the same source, what we would call the high command of what we would call in theological literature, the super angelic, the archangelic. In the Sanskrit tradition, the maha avatars, the greater minds that comprise what we would call in political science, consoles or areas of communication with the human race. Right, so he, and of course, it was around the time he was also bringing Uri Geller to the fore, to the populist uh, notion. But anyway, so he and Uri would see extraterrestrial vehicles, but in addition to that, they felt that there was a consciousness behind that it was maybe even working on another level, even a greater level, a more all encompassing level behind these extraterrestrials. And he did call them the nine. And these were supposedly nine principles that made up the universe and really was just part of, you know, the consciousness trying to help humanity for the next, you know, we'll say 50 to 60 years because they felt uh, from their information, and some of this came through Phyllis Schlemmer and others. Who work with the uh, FBI and also uh, intelligence services. That, that there was going to be major changes and we needed to grow up. We needed to work more collectively. We needed to be more peaceful. Now, everything that we've been talking about now, they actually did bring up in the 70s. And that period of time was, should we say, very critical because the policies of Henry Kissinger had failed with uh, diplomacy of peace in the Middle East. And therefore, those in high command positions in the American government were looking at the possibility, however remote, that sensitives of those with extraordinary mental powers could, should we say, come together with a type of roadmap that would advance the American position 
of peace and harmony in the Middle East. And of course, you know, a lot of the SRI material went eventually to the military. And so what do they do with that? Well, you know, um, actually, um, uh, one of our presidents came out with the fact there was one time a Soviet, it was President Carter, came out with a uh, Soviet jet was trying to escape or leave and defect to the US. And I think at some point they either shot him down or it came down. And it came down in the area of Africa. West Africa. West Africa. And we kind of knew, uh, the government kind of knew where that was, but we wanted to get the guy and at least the black box and information that he had. So they called the psychics. Uh, the government called the psychics and said, where's this airplane? We got to get there before the Russians make it, you know? And the psychics came forward and said, well, there's a river here and there's trees here and that's where the plane is. Well, we did get there before the Russians got there. So, I mean, that's just one example. But and later, Kara Carter at a news conference, uh, let the cat out of the bag, he said during his administration. That was the most amazing One extraordinary thing. event was the hunt for the Russian plane. But in addition to that, you can imagine if there is like, you know, military things going on right now, are we using psychics to say, where is this and where is that? And can we, you know, maybe send a drone in or, you know, look with our satellites or whatever. So don't think these things aren't being used at all. And, you know, in a sense, uh, if, it, if you're if you're on the side that thinks it's a good thing, you know, then that's what you want to do, because why risk lives and things like that? Life is precious and the opportunity to bring forth the new tools of science, particularly consciousness development is such an exciting part of our work with and, young people throughout the world. And I just want to add the important thing is, and we've been saying this a lot in our own teachings, is contact with extraterrestrials. They function the same way we've been talking about. They see everything or they're connected in quantumly entangled with the brain waves, especially of people that they've been in contact with or who have seen extraterrestrial spaceships. You don't even have to talk to the guy. You can just see a spaceship and you're quantumly entangled. And when you are at that point, they are also totally tuned in to everything that they're saying. In fact, I wrote about this in a, a chapter we did in a recent book by Alan Steinfeld called Making Contact, where someone was sitting in a, in a kitchen. She was told what not to say by extraterrestrials. And this guy was pushing her, pushing her, pushing her. He was a lawyer. He was a lawyer. He's a litigation attorney. He's really incredible. To say more. And all of a sudden, the shelf literally flew up. In the kitchen. You know? And he, she says, I can't say anymore. They're, like, they're listening. You know, I mean, it might be scary to you, but that's how some of these other side realities work. They have a consciousness connection. The consciousness field is open. It's very hard to block it. Well, one of the things that uh, early on in the 1970s that I guess led to you being well known to a wider community was the book you wrote, The Keys of Enoch. And you talk about using a Merkaba vehicle or being taken by a Merkaba vehicle to these realms where you had these incredible experiences and then you wrote the what you recalled of all of that. So why don't you tell us about the, the Keys of Enoch, exactly how that happened and, and, and why it's still relevant today? I'm holding up the Keys of Enoch with the divine name in the uh, mystical traditions of the Middle East. The Hashem, the divine name is what we call here the yod heh vod -He, the name of the source of all sources. And then we have the Dove, a symbol of higher gifts of communication that is projecting seven levels of information to human hands that are catching the information that represents the seven seals of the seven chakras, the makeup of the human genetic code. Right. But this is actually the reason for the divine name, for example, is the fact that, you know, our genetic code, as Dr. Jack was just saying, actually has four major nucleo bases, by the way, all of which have now been found in outer space. Uh, and basically it's by rearranging that into three that we get our DNA. So what he was shown in, and it was not an extraterrestrial experience. I always have to qualify that. It was not a channeled experience. As you said, Michael, it was a Merkaba experience, which means he actually left this planet, but was taken into other dimensional realms um, in higher spaces beyond the extraterrestrial. And he was shown scenarios past, 
present and future. And some of this, of course, has come out with the book, in the book, but uh, the DNA was one aspect of that, of how our DNA code is not a happenstance code. It didn't just happen. And we don't even think it really came. I mean, there were Nephilim. I, I know you're very much into the book of Enoch, and I we agree with that. And that was very clear that we'll say other species that were superior to us came and had relations with the daughters of man and created these giants, which started destroying the planet so that literally the angels and other forces had to cause the flood. I mean, that's so I'm going to show word for word. The in, audience we can help yeah. Desiree help me. One of the schematics showing how the human DNA is working with the permutations of the divine name, yod heh vod -Heh, the name of the eternal one. Right, we consider this a God code. Again, this was written in 73. Um, and so basically the codes are there, the codes, and that's why some people see these beings and some of them don't look like us. Some of them are little rays and insectoids and all the different types, reptilians. But the really uh, ones that oftentimes people see on other realities actually look very much like us because our code system really has a connection to their code system. So it's really just a mathematical code that then comes into concretization in three-dimensional DNA. Again, each of the assertions we're making is supported by a film document. So here we see a picture of the, the uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and we see the various variations that come out of the human genetic code, which is also responsible for other similar species forms that are like us in terms of the cosmic origin, namely that behind the evolutionary process, there is a higher evolutionary process. If you take the fact that it doesn't take much for us to be, uh, for our DNA to be rearranged and look like a pig, you know, it doesn't take much. It's all literally, uh, it's just substances that are arranged in a certain language code, according to Peter Goriath, who was an amazing uh, instructor and friend of ours. You know, once you change those language codes, you get into other types of species. So not to overwhelm the audience, each one of our chapters here goes with a particular project, a particular film, and a, uh, shall we say, a ongoing project with younger engineers, biologists in evolutionary biology, who recognize that the human genome is being, shall we say, decoded, and we're being made aware now that we're not that unique. There are other life forms in the universe. Right, and, and Dr. Jack also in the keys go into uh, Egypt because we worked, uh, we've worked since then, since this book came out a lot in Egypt, and he was one of the first to say that the uh, star shafts from the King's Chamber relate to Orion. The bulb of Orion. And so that was one of the statements he made in the keys way before uh, Baval, who we personally love. He's a great guy. He came 20 years later. <laughs> so does we are saying that there are chapters beneath uh, of information, beneath of the Sphinx and beneath the pyramids of Giza that hold the secret to the human evolutionary project we call the Adamic story. So why don't you tell us more about this Adamic story, about the creation of humanity and the role of extraterrestrial in that because uh, this is a very controversial issue now at an age where um, the existence of extraterrestrial life is being considered by many more people and and those who have a religious persuasion they they think of this almighty powerful god creator of the entire multiverse um, had a direction of humanity but you know we're told from the contactees and many sources that it was actually extraterrestrials that created so can you elaborate on who exactly created humanity? Very simply, the keys of Enoch are a further explanation of the Adam and Eve story in the book of Genesis. We read very carefully the Bashith Baraz. We say in the Hebrew, the book of Genesis, the seventh day didn't come to an end. And so we are in a, shall we say, a unique area of cooperation, if we wish, with cosmic intelligence. And one form of that cosmic intelligence is not the extraterrestrial, but what we call the ultra-terrestrial. The, the forms of intelligence that have evolved beyond the physical form, but still operate through a consciousness communication system with the human race. Because of the situation now occurring on Mother Earth with, should we say, the, the climate change and the possibility of biospheric uh, collapse on, the, on Mother Earth, and this is something that's been echoed by specialists at the United Nations. 
uh, we are on the brink of destruction of the whole human society. And the cosmic others we call the ultra terrestrials are giving us an opportunity to recalculate our blueprint of evolution, usually through mental or telepathic communication. Right, because they're kind of like our cosmic cousins in the sense of, this is what Dr. Jack was shown, and we do introduce a whole cosmology, which I think is unique, uh, but also a biblically based and even ancient uh, Eastern structurally based. You know, basically we feel we were kind of energy bodies. And the Bible says we actually fell into this reality and had to take on bodies of skin. Well, who were we before that? Uh, historically, or uh, it's also known as the Adam Kanmon, which was the primordial or original force the, of the heavenly Adam. image of man and woman. And I always say, and I'm sure you've said this many times too, Michael, that you know it's interesting to go to another planet and see you know reptilians, insectoids, praying mantises. But what's really unique is to go to another planet and find us. That means that we did not evolve here. And we would even take it one step further that we actually came into this sun universe or local universe, um, really from a higher blueprint is what we feel. And that's why some of the extraterrestrials really, really want our DNA. An uh, old friend of mine, and you might have met him, his name was Posty, Virgil Armstrong, wrote a book, They Need Us, We Don't Need Them. And basically he was saying that these extraterrestrials, either because they've misused their DNA by too much cloning, or because they realize that our DNA is kind of a little bit having soul connection, if I can say that in a positive way, um, that they want some of that. And so we feel we did come from a higher soul vibratory frequency, and we're here to kind of help not only this planet, but really to help the universe. And there's many extraterrestrials out there that are like us, Maybe some have elongated skulls, some have a little bit difference from what we do, but they're actually also here trying to help awaken us because we forgot who we are. And because we're cosmic cousins. So there's two interesting scenarios being played out now in the world media, the downward spiral of climate change and the end of everything we know, it, the end of history. On the other hand, there is an upper spiral taking place amongst younger scientists, scholars, and students who see beyond the veil of the old historic mysteries that our Bible is really a scientific textbook within, which we would say, uh, biblical prose that indicates that when we find the divine spark within us and reach out to the positive forces of the universe, they in turn can help us engineer a better future. And this is the exciting time that we live in to realize that there are time doors that are being opened, sacred areas of the world that the indigenous revere that are important areas of future contact. And we've been involved with indigenous leaders all throughout the world. We're honorary chiefs of the Shabanti peoples of Southern Brazil. And we've been in their villages where they've seen light probes and they know that the star nations are coming closer to human civilization. In the essence are working now within human civilization by those who elevate their consciousness to think for positive solutions. And I'd love to get more into the time doors and what's underneath the ground, so to speak, in certain sacred areas. But I do want to say a little bit more about the Keys of Enoch. And Dr. Jack, in 1973, when he had that experience, was told that actually to help humanity, that these higher levels of intelligence were going to give us 64 areas of science to help us catch up to those who are, we'll say, flying in spaceships to see that we're more on par than we think we are. So not only with our own brainwaves being able to communicate and share, but also the fact that our technology needed to be advanced. The problem with advancing technology is that we have to have, we'll say, the heart and the consciousness to go with that. But if you look at it, you know, DNA understanding, look at how many things can be cloned now or made, you know, with CRISPR. Uh, also other situations, historical that we now know. I mean, there's even Wikipedia and you know how conservative they are, are going back 60,000 years practically in North and South America. Base. Yeah. In information so, base. So, uh, you know, everything is literally not, and the stars themselves to understand, we just saw what the center of our own Milky Way black hole through a coordination of networks of I think about eight different astronomical networks on the planet. So, I mean, you know, we're really advancing to understand who we are, not to mention about the James Webb telescope that tells us, you know, we're just like this little speck somewhere in this whole energy field of gravity and magnetic fields exist everywhere. But we are somebody, somebody in the vastness of the 
billions and billions and billions of galaxies. We are something of importance. Our friend Linda Moulton Hull suggests that the importance is the human soul, which is the interesting subject that we've been looking at. Well, one so of the things, trying... one of the things that I've been uh, particularly fascinated in is the idea of a kind of temporal war between different extraterrestrial factions and that one negative group of factions began working with Nazi Germany during the Second World War, even prior to the Second World War, and actually helped them establish some breakaway civilization or space program in Antarctica. So, you know, what do you know about that? Well, as you know, I was involved with several documentaries uh, way back, I think early on in the late 80s, early 90s, that looked at all sides of the equation. Uh, much of this has been discounted by uh, Nick Pope, thinking that this is an exaggerated romanticism that's being projected uh, at the end of World War II. My uh, research in German archives and talking to members of the Pendamina group directly, while I was doing some consulting work at Jeff Propulsion Lab, suggest that uh, there were trade-offs at the end of the war with experimental craft and these experimental craft being used by the allies are the subject of uh, interest and would suggest why some of this has been beyond classification or beyond top secret. So the answer to your question is, uh, we believe that there are positive uh, sources of intelligence in the universe. Uh, thousands of years before World War II, they were interacting with the human race. And my research with shamans in Africa and South America, as well as government people, connected with Brazil and South Africa suggest that there were other civilizations that were on Mother Earth doing geological surveys long before European history was written. Right, and of course, Maria Orsic supposedly was the uh, channel, or at least one of them, for the Nazi party, or at least for Hitler at that time, and some of the scientists to devise these space Craft. It's not unusual. Uh, this is, you know, there's a lot of information that can be gotten both from, we'll say, without psychics and with psychics to inspire and to move forward. And that's part of our work to say, you know, we, the consciousness field is available to anyone and anything. You just need to realize you can go outside of yourself. Channels in that sense, which we don't normally support, but they do provide oftentimes that information. So we do believe that the um, Nazis after the war did go down to the Antarctic. However, we feel that the Antarctic bases that were there were much older. And this comes from an associate of ours named Elizabeth Clark from South Africa, who, who had, worked with British intelligence during World War II but who had been in touch with intelligence face-to-face, -face, not through channeling, but face-to-face, -face, that told her about bases in the Antarctic, you know, we'll say tens of thousands of years ago, at least before the last ice age. So when I met her in the early 80s, she gave me the name of the planet that her associate was from, that she was taken to, if you believe her story. Uh, that planet was Mitong. And I told her in the Keys of Enoch, my book written much earlier in 73, there is a reference to Mitone. And so we became friends because there was a linguistic tie-in that was very important. So she confided in us information, which I'm not going to go into detail with, but it's simplifying. She said that a group of intelligent beings that looked like the humans were on this planet momentarily, thousands of years before. Actually, and because of this, yeah. the solar... Uh, changes taking place, they had to leave the planet. Right. If you le read her book, which is called Beyond the Light Barrier, her uh, civilization she was in touch with was on Venus, Earth, and Mars. This is what she said. And her experience took place in the 50s. She only wrote about it in the 80s because of the ability to get things out. But basically, that that because of solar flares, and changes with the sun, because she says that this is an unstable star. And Dr. Jack also mentions the sun is a variable star, which means it really can't rely on it for stability. Uh, they had to move off. And they said they left some civilizations here on the earth and a few on Mars. Mars did not survive as well. And they went to the closest uh, star because that's as far as they could go. They were you know, still fairly primitive in that sense. And uh, she said that was in the Centauri constellation. Well, if you go back to the 50s, 
Centauri wasn't necessarily considered the closest star, it was usually Bernard's star, but she was absolutely right. And she said that that was a stable system because it had more than one star. And she had the whole data because she had visited there. And I saw the data books that she kept were the journals and she had signatures of Russian scientists, British scientists, German scientists, and American scientists who were reviewing her notes. She had no scientific background to know the uh, integrated relationships that were present in terms of changes that we were facing. I remember she wrote this back in the 60s. Her experience was in the 50s. I met her and collaborated with her on several important areas, such as the sun we call our source of life as a variable star. So there were things that put us into a direct relationship with her and she showed me a picture of the actual vehicle that had landed in the Drakensberg Mountains. And I just have to say, I mean, going back to some of your research, which we're familiar with as well, Michael, is that, you know, yes, we do believe that a lot of the uh, preliminary, like the Vril uh, spacecraft were designed by the Germans. And of course, you know, Werner von Braun has some knowledge about that when he came to our country. But bottom line, I still feel we have the same dilemma we'll say in the 40s and 50s that we have today. What are, what are we looking at? Are we looking at our own spacecraft that we've designed in the US, Russia, German, whatever, or are we looking at extraterrestrial spacecraft? This is still, I think, and if you listen to the recent hearings, it's still the dilemma. What are we looking at? And of course, I still believe that a lot more than we think are extraterrestrial. We like to put it down to the Russians or to whatever, to ourselves, but there's still a lot of extraterrestrials coming around right now and working directly with many people. So oh, the bottom <laughs> line here, but you can just inject this as a conclusion, the bottom line here is the universe is full of positive intelligence. The problem is the human nature, particularly the male form of aggressiveness, uh, the desire to dominate through technology and the misuse of information in circles of political science for the last 75 years has shown, as Pogo has said in the cartoon strips years ago, the enemy is us. We have misappropriated information. We have not looked at the advantages of working with cosmic intelligence. We do not understand that we must not put weapons of mass destruction out of space, any weapons in violation of UN laws. We have to grow up and recognize that we are about to join a galactic family of nations and that we have an opportunity to understand the privilege of using higher consciousness or the God-centered nature of the divine spark within us to help all humanity make this great transition possible. I think uh, what you said about Elizabeth Clara talking about the sun give, being given information that the sun and uh, solar activity ha has been involved in some kind of past cataclysms on Earth is, is very interesting because that matches with uh, some of the information I got from Secret Space Program insiders saying that uh, the, the, C the Solar Warden Program run by the Navy actually became very interested in history of micronovas in our solar system and that uh, the, the actual missions to the moon were partly conducted to get evidence to find out, well, how did these micronovas happen in the past? So, so that kind of dovetails with what you were told by Elizabeth Clara and her contact, uh, uh, Acon. Now, more recently, there's a gentleman, Ben Davidson, who's the founder of, I think it's called... Uh, uh, solar watch or solarweather.com and and he's done a lot of work on micronovas and he's uh, looked at peer-reviewed papers and says that these micronovas have occurred regularly and I think he's come up with a figure of every 12 13 thousand years and believes that a micronova is is imminent and and I think he thinks that something is going to happen around the, the next solar minimum which is going to be around the 2030s so is that something you've come across in your research anything you can comment well, on we that? work with I was involved with the Mayan calendar system, the mathematics of which have not been understood. And uh, in fact, we gave a lecture recently with uh, a, a person from Chile who was uh, a recognized specialist in the Mayan mathematical system, which is one of the most superb systems ever left to the human race by the cosmic others in my logic. And that suggests that between 2026 and the early 30s, uh, 2030s, we're going to see gross uh, geophysical changes. Right, but one of the things that Dr. Deck does talk about in the Keys of Enoch is the fact, yes, that there was a shift on the even the planetary crust. There's definitely always 
uh, from time periods, the magnetic field shifting. But if the magnetic field shifts and we're at a low ebb and we're getting close to that lower ebb, we're not there yet. And then you have solar flares. You basically can really, well, say, shift the whole crust of the, uh, of the earth, can have a slippage because we're being so exposed. Right now, of course, we're in our little cocoon of magnetic fields. So he was shown that, in, that there is a future change that's taking place. And it's not just from the sun, even though the sun is the one that's flaring up when we feel, but it's actually coming into our solar system. It's probably having to do with more of a larger cycle of where we are positioned in the Milky Way itself. So I, I'm not familiar about the micronovas, but you know that type of energy, uh, Dr. Tech talks about uh, um, neutralizing electromagnetic fields can be part of all of this. So, so in the book, The Keys of Enoch, chapter 118 or key 118, I give the mathematics of the rapid melting of the polar areas. So this is 1973, the release of torque and the things that we're seeing now some 49 years later, so. But we really are not doomsayers in the sense because that's why the extraterrestrials are here. And we feel even maybe the Nimitz experience that they, you know, they saw something in the water off of uh, San Diego might've been a neutralization of some of the tension being built up on the, the ocean plates. Yeah, on the plates themselves, on the San Andreas Fault, for example. And some of the other situations that we've seen, you know, neutralizing, even the Fukushima, there was UFOs that seemed to fly around there to neutralize some of that energy, very similar to what took place in the 50s uh, in uh, White Sands. So we think they're actually here to kind of help us, but they probably can't stop everything. They're helping us to advance us, to contact us, to give us chances to be more positive, more spiritual, more connected. I mean, why do you want a warfaring nation up into outer space? You know, they'll keep us here as long as they can help it. Well, as Dan Freeman once <laughs> said, what would you help a, a planet that's full of tri tribal warfare? <laughs> yeah. Tribal warfare seems to be the calling card of most of the political establishments. In fact, the New York Times Desiree's hip right, on this right. for the says last, that there was just a few years of peace. Well, actually, for the last 3,000 years, they cited something like 270 years of peace. That's out of 3,000. So we're really, really not that positively bent at this point. But that doesn't mean that we're not cosmic cousins. They're not here to help us. And that's why we're not here today, gone tomorrow. They really are trying to feed us the information, the knowledge, the wisdom. And I think you're part of it. We're all part of it to help humanity to make that next quantum leap, which may not be staying only on this planet. What we need is what astronaut Edgar Mitchell said is the overview effect to see our little blue green planet from position of outer space. We're all together in this rowboat of spaceship Earth, and we have to correct the balance. And this is what we're all about. We're trying to bring out a much greater cosmology of consciousness to show us that our ancestors recognized that there were other star systems of intelligence that periodically did drop by to upgrade human civilization. And we're at such a unique time of having a space portal open for an upgrade. I know one of the areas that you've done quite a bit of work in, and, and that is kind of groundbreaking, is the, the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid at Giza. And you actually led an expedition there in 1997 to the tomb of Osiris, which I believe uh, was a discovery that, that you had made. So can you just elaborate on that? And I know that there was also, uh, there's a quote attributed to you that during that expedition, that, that you found chambers that are larger, this is the quote, larger than the largest cathedrals ever erected by modern man, end quote. So can you elaborate? First of all, in the keys of Enoch, you'll see this picture of the Sphinx more in the female form, which you would say the, the other aspect of the human psyche, the feminine, the compassionate side, seeing that there is a chamber inside the Sphinx itself where humans were brought for initiation purposes, but then underneath the Sphinx of Giza, there's a spiral. And then at the bottom of the spiral, there's the human embryo, which suggests that the Sphinx was built as a model of human evolution. Right. So Zahi Awaz later, when we were there in the 90s, actually showed that there is an opening in the back of the rump, as you well, the far back of the Sphinx, and then also one on the side that they found to date. They but we did say, the original research that but, he took credit for. You know, they, yeah, but that was the tomb of Osiris. So right between, we'll say, the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx, 
in alignment with the middle pyramid is if you go down literally 100 feet, which is about 30 meters, you find three levels of tombs. And we were with actually the shore expedition. They were the ones funding the research. So it did look like huge rooms. Uh, they were clearly, again, 100 feet down, cut corners. I mean, they were not just a cave. They actually had cut corners. I think you have so some other pictures. So here you see pictures. a picture from the top of the Great Pyramid. The Kefren Pyramid is on the horizon and uh, tombs are in the foreground that have not been excavated as of this picture in the 1970s. But between the pyramids and the road that comes out from the Sphinx proper, the, the avenue, we well, were able to use ground penetrating radar and locate in 1997, what later was called the Tomb of Osiris. We have the opportunity actually to bring cameras beneath uh, the Giza area some 33 meters with our battery systems lowered by cables and do the research, which again, we could not complete without permission from the Egyptian authorities. But they took over our expedition after we had found this, this the uh, tomb of Osiris and later in the year 1999 on a Fox television special claimed that they had found the tomb, but we were actually there two years before. And in a slight uh, reference, Zai Hawa says on camera, oh, by the way, there was a group here two years before. Well, that was our research group. Right, so just, uh, we have a book called Giza's Industrial Complex, in which we co-wrote with a friend of ours who's a contractor, uh, James Brown. But you can see on the top, I'll try to put this in or send you a couple of copies that, uh, you can see me standing there with our friend Boris Said, and uh, you can see how vast and large these uh, structures are. Chambers are. Yeah, but I mean, we still feel there's more. We don't think that that's the end of it. Uh, we did some ground penetrating radar with technology and as saw, well as using musical instruments. And then there was some cavities behind it. So we could it. be able to get what we will call a musical feedback system in terms of resonance of companion chambers. So the idea of Giza's industrial complex is we actually think the Egyptians used what is now called saltwater batteries or sodium ion batteries, which is really the guy, the technology that's uh, up against lithium ion batteries. If we don't have enough lithium and it doesn't really work in the long run, sodium ion batteries will be the next type of technology. And we believe the Egyptians actually had sodium ion batteries. All it takes, they had salt water, had a whole salt water lake. They had plenty of sun and they, for some reason, were able to generate energy to do what they needed to do. So the complexities of what Desiree is speaking about is in our book called Giza's Industrial Complex, that the Egyptians at a much earlier date were able to master the use of hydraulics, the use of solar energy, the use of under ground labyrinthian passageways, hydrogen gas, uh, as well as to actually perfect a certain type of gilding of metals and stones that we have yet to, to uh, uh, discover. In other words, there was knowledge far in advance of what we would call historic cultures of that time period. And, and so that goes back to why 100 feet down would you ever find a tomb? I mean, it's cute that Hawass uh, said, oh, it's the tomb of Osiris because he was God of the underworld. But chances are, we believe that they actually used to store certain gases or even maybe some volatile chemicals or nuclear chemicals inside these rocks. Very similar to what you find in Sweden for the storage of nuclear materials. So we feel that they understood this, they used it, they did it. And uh, it was much more sophisticated technology uh, than we know today. I'm actually yeah. holding one picture of an amulet that was found with a very, very, uh, should we say, noticeable gamma ray radiation level. This was analyzed at Jet Propulsion Lab, showing that the Egyptians experiment with many things and use the pyramids as a type of information archive for a wide variety of energy alternatives. We are now reaching a point where we're reconsidering the Egyptian models in the Middle East. And in, in modern technology. And even the cotton at Giza, which is a famous uh, advertiser right. there's, is using there's a hydrogen, uh, to sell pillows. Yeah, well, yeah. But there's a hydrogen battery, actually, that was designed first by Carnegie Mellon and an offshoot from that. And they use actually cotton to differentiate between the anode and the cathode. So that's what Egypt... 
Egyptians had cotton. It was one easy thing. I know one of the things that fascinates people about uh, the Giza complex is the idea of a hall of records uh, somewhere underneath uh, the, the pyramids or underneath the, the Sphinx. Edgar Casey talked about it. Um, there's uh, also ancient historians like Herodotus talked about this giant labyrinth. And underneath that was this uh, incredible complex of chambers that he wasn't allowed to see. And, and I know you believe that the pyramid is the most logical place to store ancient records. So, so do you think it's all there underneath the, the Giza complex, a hall of records and an ancient city preserving all the records of Atlantis and earlier civilizations? First of all, I'll show you a schematic of the Herodotus reference to an area of Fayum, which is a schematic you'll see here on the page, I'm pointing to it right now, of our gargantuan uh, complex of 3,000 rooms. This is what the labyrinth was supposed to be about. Why would you ever have 3,000 rooms unless they were literally cells of energy technology? So it was, a, it, was. it was a large energy cell collector system that was put in position in a unique way. I shared this information with some of my colleagues at uh, Lockheed Martin, SRI, and they were amazed at the preciseness of how this was laid out, connected with a waterway, connected with a process of energy engineering, uh, just a superb model of how the Egyptians, uh, we believe under guidance of exoso intelligence, could design these things and leave them underground as models for future science. Right, so this is El Fayum, which is uh, less than an hour south of the Giza Plateau. I just wanna say this is really uh, ground penetrating radar. And you can see there's actually cavities there. We're looking for the labyrinth. This was done by the Polish archaeological society who was working there. But you can see that uh, there's probably is some sort of structure and Herodotus, as Dr. Tech mentioned, actually, you know, does record this. So, so to answer your question directly, there's not one room that's specifically the Hall of Records, it's the whole mathematical schema that's laid out above ground and underground together. But that doesn't mean that there aren't sacred cavities both under the Sphinx, as we saw also with ground penetrating radar, there was a, if you look at the mystery of the Sphinx, it was a documentary, Dr. Hertek was in uh, one of the versions, you could see that there was a whole, literally cavity underneath the paw of Sphinx, just like Edgar Casey had said. And also, I know you've looked at the uh, Versace Mountains, we were also there at the other Sphinx, and uh, there's caves all over that location. So, so we're talking about now Eastern Europe, Romania, which is now uh, connected with the Black Sea area. If you drop a plumb line from that particular area, what we're referring to the Romanian Sphinx, quote unquote. You're not far from you, you the You one Sphinx. of the, the, the Libyan desert of Northern Egypt. And of course, the teaching that we had received was there was an underground passageway from what we would call the Carpathian Mountains in that area directly to Egypt, as well as from Israel to Egypt. And so the pyramids of Egypt represent really the central matrix of secondary matrices that were so designed that people could go literally underground through these labyrinthian tunnel systems and entertain information that was important when Egypt was, according to the Egyptian Coptic Nakamadi text, the schoolhouse of the gods, small g. And, it, and again, you know, it does not mean that things aren't stored underground that we'll find certain crystalline deposits as we have in Yucatan that actually show like certain types of coding mechanisms. So all over the world, I believe that there were deposits of ancient wisdom. One could call them the hall of records, but more uniquely to just tie it together and see that these were all cultures that had some sort of connection to each other and had that wisdom and knowledge of going back to Atlantis or going back to Mu. But the Sphinx face is important for reasons that are quite obvious. The Sphinx represents the human body, the human mind position on the body of the lion, which according to the ancient theosophists and philosophers, represented the, the solar matrix or the solar logos. So Dr. Tank says that putting our face makes us being able to conquer the solar vehicle. And when we can, we can literally go off of this planet or and use the, the solar, solar system. spectrum for energy. And this is what the Egyptians were selling us with their salt water batteries. Amazing research is yet to be done. And we're very privileged to know this and to have had the opportunity to work behind the scenes underground as well as at the very top 
of the perimeter complex, well, not only okay. it, but throughout the world. Well, I know you've been to Romania and you've actually seen the Romanian Sphinx and uh, some of the information that I've recently become very fascinated by is in this series of books called Transylvania, uh, this Transylvania series, and it talks about a whole of records under the, under the Romanian Sphinx. And what was inter interesting that it mentioned a tunnel going all the way from that Romanian Sphinx to the Sphinx under Egypt. So I thought that was that was fascinating. That uh, is that kind of corroboration. Um, we know this also from colleagues who work with the late Dr. Jalen Heineck, whose uh, parents were from Czechoslovakia, mine also from that region. And so there was a folklore in uh, in Eastern Czechoslovakia of the importance of these underground chambers that were built thousands of years before modern civilization. And people were living in caves, and I mean, in a positive way, they had sacred caves that they would go into. We visited one of them. There are several of them that you can go as a tourist. And also we visited, and I can't say it correctly, but it's Samaragustia Regina, which was the capital of the Dacians for uh, about 100 BC. And it's amazing. I mean, it's huge in that sense, but it also had looked like Stonehenge type this of- This was the Eastern part of the Roman Empire. Yeah, so, but it was, this was before the Roman Empire that it actually had, we'll say Stonehenge type mathematics and uh, East Gate, West Gate, the way the sun came in, you have literally standing stones that were just one small part of this huge complex. So that whole area was very, very sacred. They had a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge. It was not a primitive culture by any means. It would not surprise me that some of the greatest discoveries had to be made would be made in the mountains of Romania, showing these vast underground caverns that perhaps contain some of the artifacts of the uh, cosmic cultures that briefly visited our planet. And just to be weird, of course, the whole Transylvania is part of that going into Hungary and all the knowledge and wisdom of being able to make some strange concoctions. Uh, they had a lot of information about plants and wisdom and knowledge from ancient times that I believe they totally incorporated into these, these sites. But what you need is the actual technical tools. Otherwise, we're simply talking blue sky. So this is where Desiree and I played a very important role behind the scenes of getting the proper archaeologists, the geologists, the remote sensing experts, and also those who are working also with what we will call paraphysical music or acoustical physics to go in and do, should we say, the initial groundwork for the deeper probes that will be made. It would not surprise me, knowing the Keys of Enoch spell out a, a planetary map of the Great Pyramid with its spokes going to Europe, going to North Africa, going also into the far Near East. And I believe not far from there are some of these places that a few people claim that there's buried UFOs. I don't, you've probably heard of that as well. So, you know, <clears throat> I believe that there was ancient UFOs. So, but we've come now into the 21st century, and this is a time of great, shall we say, discovery. We're of the opinion that this is the most important time to be alive, to connect the ancient history that's been overlooked with the future history of contact with the cosmic intelligence, we would call the Galactic Federation and beyond, those that were referred to in ancient spiritual text as the Elohim or the forces of the divine. So with those ancient UFOs that, that are buried, I mean, this is one of the things that some of my sources have been talking about, uh, space arcs, that these are quite ancient and that they're buried all over the all over the earth and that they are designed to perform various functions depending on whether whether or not the earth is about to undergo a cataclysmic set of changes to kind of rescue people or whether the earth is about to go undergo a kind of graduation into the cosmic community and and their and they their function is to kind of like reveal themselves and share this advanced technology so what do you know about space arcs buried around the earth or in our solar system well, I would just say in general, I think both are happening, exactly what you said. That's why we really like some of your research, Michael, because there's no doubt we talk about the 12 grids, even the 24 grids that are being activated around the planet. In fact, we'll probably hopefully get to Egypt later this year. But in addition to that, uh, we also want to call people's attention to the Mauritius, an island off of Africa that has seven pyramids. No one knows even why they're there. We also hope to go to the Azores, where there are pyramids. I mean, 
people don't even know there's pyramids in the Azores. I mean, they're also all over the place. These are all part of a grid network structure. Dr. Jack actually came out with that in the Keys of Enoch, both artificial and natural grid points that are being activated. I grew up by Miami and the whole idea of Bermuda Triangle, that's an activated grid point. If you listen to reports right now of what places have had the most sightings of UFOs, they'll tell you California, well, because it's a huge state and people are looking up, but then the second place is Florida because there's bases off of Florida. There always have been bases off of Florida. I saw a UFO when I was 15 years old, which is probably why I got interested in his research. The idea is that, you know, these things are now starting to come up and as even the military said, there's more and more sightings. Yes, some of the sightings are, are illusions, are fakes, are government research, but there's a lot more extraterrestrials also starting to activate here. So, you know, yes, the things buried underground are starting to be activated as well. And your reference to the arcs is very important. As you know, some of the great pyramids have on the very top in, uh, shall we say- uh, Like Uxmal? Uxmal, something that looks like a French bathtub. I mean, models of small arcs or boats that survive cataclysmic changes. So in terms of places throughout the world, we would say with our indigenous brothers and sisters, there are 12, possibly 13 major areas around the world that represent the historic cultures of contact that are symbolized usually in a pyramidal temple or design of an arc that symbolized in the context of a much higher perspective of the boat of life or the boat of Nut in UT going back into outer space, connected with the stars of Orion, or as it was called in the Egyptian, Imsak, the imperishable one. So we're looking uh, for younger geologists, archeologists who are interested in future science. We get, we're writing textbooks and we've got a uh, film of our research at the Romanian Sphinx that will be released hopefully sometime in the near future so people can come to their own conclusions that we've never been alone, that the mothering cultures of the world have always used these basic symbols of connecting really the female side of life, not necessarily the, the male side, which came later, but the female side of compassion, of rebirth, of regenesis with the mothering heavens, the mothering nature of the universe with Mother Earth. I know you've also done some work in identifying stargates or portals that form a network all over the earth and uh, in our solar system and beyond. So how do these stargates work? How do the portals work? And I know you've done a lot of work with acoustics. So is it something to do with kind of acoustical sound or some other kind of frequency that's essential for being able to activate and, and use these uh, portals or stargates? We'll be publishing a book that deals with the refined studies that we've done over many decades in the Egyptian temples, and it's quite amazing. We will show you uh, micrographs in a documentary or at least in a textbook that will revisit these historic chambers, for example, in the Great Pyramid, which are more than just ordinary chambers. They represent really areas of uh, the human body personified in terms of sound waves. At one point, we did some uh, testing of acoustical physics, as Desiree shows you in this particular picture, the whole grand gallery of the Great Pyramid of Isa lit up in golden light for a fraction of a second. So this is an actual picture, an actual document, part of a project that we're doing with uh, specialists who would work with NASA, even the areas of space communication, who are interested in what we will call the use of, uh, what we call a musical physics that the ancients had designed in terms of these inner chambers to raise consciousness quickly and make a person aware that he or she was part of a greater template of understanding. Right, and Dr. Jack calls in the Keys of Enoch all these pyramids around the world chrono monitors. They're actually placed in certain places to be activated at a particular time, but also to send and receive information about what's going on around the planet. One of the places in the Merkava experience he had, he was actually taken through the belt of Orion. So he said this in the 70s and much later, of course, um, people have started saying, yes, the Orion structure is a type of vortex point. And it, that's where he, and it's really, we're in the Orion arm of our galaxy, which is why I think we're so connected. People with, did not know at that time. We're talking about transphysical experiences of higher consciousness. Right, going from this reality, 
this three slash fourth dimensional reality into other realms. So fifth, sixth, we'll even say 24 dimensional realities. He went through the, uh, we'll say the belt of Orion that takes you to other realities. So all these pyramids are like vortex points around the globe and they will be activated by ourselves, all of us collectively as, and I know people have been doing this for many years themselves going to put crystals in key places. Right now, we're actually filming from Sedona, which has had lots and lots of uh, contact and sightings from people who just come in and visit. They say, wow, I saw those lights, you know? So these are all the different vortexes that are being activated at this time because we are being prepared for contact and also for direct abilities to go beyond the limitations that we've had for the last 6,000 years. So if you look at the statues in Easter Island, for example, you will see that underneath the gargantuan statues, the hands are connected in the position of a holding of the belt. If you look at the statuary in Gobekli Tepe in Eastern Turkey or Anatolia, Again, you look at these gargantuan statues, the, the symbolism of the belt is important. Where the hands are placed. We believe yeah. that these are exoteric as well as esoteric symbols of how the ancients of many cultures connected with the belt of Orion, which was probably the mothering culture or what we would reconstruct as to be the doorway for other life forms that are very advanced, that are really in, a, in an energy form rather than any physical technology that are behind even the extraterrestrials themselves. And being the female here, I'd like to also point out that Dr. Tank mentioned also the Pleiades as being a key constellation. In fact, we his his information was saying that our coding structure for our damaged species actually came from the Pleiades connection. And uh, that took place way before, uh, we'll say, uh, Billy Myers even came up with that term. It, actually, I think they were almost simultaneous, but Billy didn't publish it until after the Keys of Enoch had come out. So the Pleiades are connected with Orion. The ancient Lakota peoples saw that there was this big Teyanin, which had the Pleiades, the really? belt of Orion, and Sirius, because the Sirius constellation of feminine energy was connected with the queen's uh, star shaft as well, or air shaft. So that they saw the Lakota as So you're speaking line. of a ceremonial map that was used by the indigenous in South Dakota. It's a the, straight line, though, practically, between the Pleiades, so, belt of Orion, and So Sirius. how do these people in the plain states of the United States have this symbolism that matches what we find in Egypt, or for that matter, what we find in certain areas of Southeast Asia. Well, you could say that they just simply looked to the sky and figured out some things, but when you go then to the Yucatan and you realize that the pyramid temples are aligned to star systems, then you realize it means much more. In short, we need a musical anthropology to fill in the gaps because acoustical physics is, in our logic, the missing piece between these historic structures and what electrifies or inspires the mind to see beyond normal space time. And one could say that our body is vibrating in a certain three-dimensional frequency vibration. And if you change that frequency vibration to a higher vibration, you actually start operating in the fifth dimension. I believe a lot of these extraterrestrials are operating first and foremost in the fifth dimension and then have to come into the third dimension if they are to be seen by us. So the music of the spheres is really the music of the temple of understanding. Once we activate our heart with better compassion for all people, we understand that there's a higher God source far beyond the extraterrestrials. We begin to grow up and realize that our body is the temple of understanding for all the temples being brought together according to a higher sacred geometry. And being activated. A higher sacred music and a higher philosophy of consciousness that shows unity rather than diversity and destruction. Well, one other more controversial topic that uh, I just wanted to get your... Uh, thoughts on was uh, this uh, the wing makers that apparently in 1972 1973 there was a uh, a discovery of a, a extraterrestrial artifacts in, at Chaco Canyon in New Mexico and a, a, an elite division within the NSA called the uh, ACIO Advanced Contact Intelligence Organization uh, was established to explore something called the Ancient Arrow Project that uh, there were like 20 23 or 24 chambers discovered there. So do you know anything about the wing makers, the Shackle Canyon discovery in 1973 and any research into that? Well, not really the particular artifact, but we have spent time in Chaco Canyon and it definitely is an alignment 
with ancient, ancient times. And not only they look at the sun and the moon, but also in alignment with the stars. And we have seen ancient artifacts throughout the world that are clearly older than 10,000 years. I, whether you wanna say they're extraterrestrial, uh, I think in some cases you have seen even space metal that seems to be of ancient origin. The famous actor Robert Redford did a documentary on Chaco Canyon. He has a beautiful dialogue where he goes through all of these interesting relationships over, shall we say, ridges and mountain passes that would be very impossible until recent times of geological tools to make such exact alignments over long or should we say in large periods. We also did studies that showed how the people of the Yucatan and the, we'll say the Southern Mexican population did come, especially when they had climate change to the North so that they actually came into the United States. So the whole area of the United States is not something to say that that's a, a new culture. We're a very, very ancient culture. And really a we'll, lot more information about our contact with extraterrestrial civilizations and we'll say the star people because we consider some of them beyond extraterrestrial will be coming out. So we're gonna be releasing more of the archeological work we've done over decades. We've been so busy, we haven't had a chance really to publish all the details. Needless to say, this brings in a panorama of recognizing as the indigenous tell us that this is the time of gathering the tribes where we begin to see these 12 or 13 areas of information converging according to sacred lines alignments. And even logarithmically speaking, NASA scientists are recognizing that there are certain mathematical relationships that follow in terms of planetary changes, even stock markets, peaks and falls, fall a type of mathematics yet to be understood. And Max Tegbrick from MIT and uh, other places has suggested that we're part of a mathematical grid that's just beginning to unfold itself. We believe that the mathematical grid, though, is also connected with higher consciousness, without which we're simply dealing with numbers. It's a series of calculated situations of solar and lunar eclipses. Right. I just want to say regarding Chaco Canyon, which is really this amazing site, uh, we're not that far from there uh, in Sedona, probably about mm, three or four hours, five hours, maybe, depending on what part you want to talk about. And there was also something known as the Bradshaw Ranch here, where people constantly saw extraterrestrials and ET beings that would make their appearance. So this area is a vortex. Um, and as well as other places around the country and the world. In fact, the U.S. authorities have actually placed a holding position around the Bradshaw Ranch because of unusual paraphysical events. So we know that there are places in Utah, southern Utah, places in Arizona, New Mexico, that seem to be areas of interest by the cosmic others. And I'm so speaking of those that would be beyond the physical dimension. So my final question, uh, the only planet of choice that Phyllis Schlemmer wrote uh, talks about the, the nine and talks about a, a, the 24 extraterrestrial civilizations. And, and at the time, it was believed or hoped that they would reveal themselves uh, sometime in the 1970s. Obviously, that didn't happen. So you know, my question to you is, is this what we are about to witness now that uh, the 24 civilizations, or what you call, I think, the engineers or what uh, others call the cedars, have returned and that they are in, about to reveal themselves? I would say definitely this is the time where we will accelerate information. To recode an ancient prophet, the book of Daniel chapter 12 says in the original text, knowledge will speed up and the humans, that is, they say, who choose to be chosen or taken the higher path will be numbered by the higher, with the higher star realms of cosmic intelligence or divine intelligence. I believe we're on the doorstep of seeing through the disclosure projects of governments throughout the world that there and are several, by ourselves. Yeah. several levels of cosmic intelligence and we must make a choice to take as it were the great leap forward as astronaut uh, Gordon Cooper said to us one time with those who will really represent the Christ force or the Christ ideal. He was a man of faith who prayed it while he was on the space mission as one of the original Pioneer Seven. I share with him research that we did privately with the famous writer Sidney Sheldon, that we are at a breaking point, that we must understand the unity 
of the cosmic intelligence. And in that sense, we understand the names of God to be a protective linguistics, a protective language that will take us really uh, beyond the cat and mouse game of what we have seen in the last 75 years of government mismanagement of knowledge into a whole new realm of being citizens of space. We will take this cosmic leap, Michael, from being, shall we say humans, humankind to space kind. We will wake up and realize the opportunities of a higher consciousness, a greater mind, a greater compassionate heart that we need to forge a whole new destiny with our cosmic counterparts. Well, and I was just wanting to say what Dr. Tech saw in his experience is that it's not just us that's going through changes, it's local systems of intelligence are also going through changes. So the level that's coordinating this, you call it the cedars, are the those at the beginning of time that will come also, at, we'll say the end of time, even though we don't think it's the end, it's an alpha, omega, alpha. It's the beginning of a new time, technically, that we're gonna go through, but they are coordinating this change, this shift of reality, because some of the planets are shifting. They will not be able to, we'll say, house the cultures that they have been for the last 6,000 years. We need, there's a change going on. And that doesn't mean it's the end at all. It's really just the new beginning. And this is what the 24 civilizations, we could say, some people call them the 24 elders, that they are coordinating. The elders actually reflect the civilizations that are coming here to help humanity, but also to all the cultures in this sector of the cosmos that are will experience change. We have outlined more than 82 different races that we're in touch with. And I'll be publishing this very soon. But the bottom line in all of this is what the ancient biblical writers spoke of the image and similitude, the original language. means We are associated as cosmic cousins with those who look like us, who will work with us because of the psychological affinities. The similitude represents the energy field of a greater process of evolution, connecting the planetary evolution with the cosmic evolution. We will recognize a whole new process of consciousness as the source of mind as well as matter. Consciousness is the source of reevaluating a whole new science that is positive rather than negative in the sense of looking at higher options and possibilities. And finally, we'll see hopefully as a result of this, a new spirituality that brings together the scientific and the spiritual side of the human experience. The human psyche is beyond the third dimension as well as evolution. Evolution doesn't stop with Mother Earth, it goes into space. We're now taking that great preparation for the great leap that will take us into what I would call affiliation, a fellowship and unity with those who are the cosmic others, the divine B'nai Elohim, as the ancient Hebrew and Aramaic writers spoke of. We are on the doorstep of one of the greatest moments in the history on one line. On the other hand, we are on the greatest moment of history in the downward entropy, if you take the back door, a fear, negativity, and, and ego, and ego assessment, so particularly from the, the male mindset that wants always war, always aggression, always negativity. No, we must go beyond the thoughts of little green monsters from Hollywood to realize the prize minds of the super minds, the super angelics that are here to help us. And that was the nine, because they considered the nine principles of life, and they were positive principles. Symbolized in the names of the name nine archangels or the nine uh, Maha avatars. Or also there was a nine connected after the eight of the Agdoad with the Egyptian as well. Correct. So we're at a time of fastening our seatbelt, Michael. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Well, that, that is a really wonderful way to kind of finish up. So where do people go if they want to learn more about you and to buy some of your books and to find any kind of videos about the work that you've done. Right. Well, it's mostly at keysofenoch.org. We also have some scientific papers at futurescience.org. And we're also creating an app that has some of our material, but the books are mostly at keysofenoch.org. We have also books that deal with the ongoing research in psychology and parapsychology, the work that we did at SRI, which I considered the real X-Files. We have work in the ongoing work with Neo-Egyptology, that is the full exploration of work in Egypt and several different locations in Upper Egypt. And also we have work on the extraterrestrial uh, needs for a new space law in my book called Negotiating with Other Worlds. 
uh, is done with several engineers in international space law studies that suggest we have to drop a new resolution. We have, if I can quote this in conclusion, we need to draft a tree on the prevention of the placement of weapons in outer space, the use of force on, or the threat of force against space objects. We have to understand the UN Charter to be a positive blueprint of how we must show ourselves to the cosmic others that we are peacemakers in space. And by doing so, we will continue the Adam and Eve story. We will be the new Adams and Eves, and the gardens of the future will be biospheres where we will bring our children and grandchildren as we explore the vastness of creation through the divine element, the divine image that's within our heart. Well, wonderful finish. Uh, that really is great information for people to digest. For many, this might be the first time that they've heard of uh, Dr. Hertak and, and, and Dr. Dr. Hertak, or both of you. So I want to encourage people to go out there, check out their website, find out more about them. I want to remind people about uh, my upcoming webinar where I talk about the Halls of Records, portals, and extraterrestrial heritage, where some of this information i'll be going diving deep into that so definitely check that out uh, on exopolitics.org so i want to thank you both for coming and being on, on exopolitics today thank you see all of you in the future join dr michael sala the world's leading expert on exopolitics for this exciting all new webinar intensive coming on may 21st entitled halls of records portals, the inner earth, and our ET heritage. Don't wait. Register today. You have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.